Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to uh, UK Anti-Doping's Clean Sport Forum 2021. Uh, my name is Charlie Busworth. I'm the Head of Communications at uh, UK Anti-Doping, and my role today will just be to sort of seamlessly join together all of our different presenters and, uh, and coordinate some of the questions, uh, hopefully from yourselves, that we can put to our esteemed group of speakers. So uh, we're delighted that you can uh, join us all today. We're just going to sort of fill the airwaves a little bit as people continue to join the session uh, before we hand over to our first speaker. Um, and uh, the sort of housekeeping parts for today, uh, we're going we're to have six sessions today. So it's quite a uh, a packed little agenda for, for the two hours that we've got this afternoon. So lots of nice, short, sharp um, uh, per presentations from our from our presenters today. Uh, if you do have any questions throughout the session, then please use uh, the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen there. If you submit your questions in there, then we will um, sort of field those at the end of each of the individual sessions. Um, depending on how many questions we get, then we may uh, have to get back to you individually just to uh, just to confirm that. So um, uh, the uh, hashtag for today's event, hashtag CSF21, um, and that is your way of uh, joining the conversation online via at really? UK oh open, especially on Twitter. I think that's where we're going to be we're most prominent. So, anyways, no, or? Oh, so yeah. we're we're um, we're ready to roll. So um, without any further ado, um, we are now just coming up to. Uh, a couple of minutes passed, so um, I'm going to hand over to UK Anti-Doping Chair, Trevor Pierce. Thank you. Thanks, um, Charlie, and I hope that uh, everyone is well. Um, we're absolutely delighted this afternoon to welcome you to the 2021 Clean Sport Forum. Uh, we've got two days of exciting uh, presentations for you, or two afternoons. You're not here for a complete 48 hours. And we look forward to some of the discussions ahead, particularly it gives us the opportunity to talk about the great success that we've seen at Tokyo 2020 and to look forward to Birmingham 2022. And hopefully important themes from those issues will jump out. So a quick summary since we last all met. Um, it's been a continuing challenging year. We know that. Uh, fortunately, things seem to be improving and therefore it's much easier for us to engage with sports and sport is coming back to be the central part of life which we expect and we enjoy so much of it. Um, we've had to operate differently and you'll hear something about that from a number of speakers whether they're athletes whether they're doping control personnel or from us more broadly uh, how, how we've had to manage doping regulation in sport through this period. That said, sport has been remarkable. We've seen an absolute wonderful po postponed uh, Tokyo 2020 with some incredible results from our Olympians and Paralympians and a real opportunity for us all to get back to understanding sport, what sport's about and to enjoying the phenomenon. Um, I'm delighted and want to say a big thank you to all of the UCAT staff who put so much work into supporting our clean games policy and in terms of the education and testing regimes, which were set up in order to support our Olympian and Paralympian attendance at Tokyo. It would be wrong of me not to mention the CJ Uja issue. And whilst we must allow for the investigation to go forward, and that's absolutely right, um, it's an apt reminder of just the difficulties and the threats which impact upon doping in sport and how we need to be continually aware of that threat and to do our best to represent UK athletes internationally and nationally in the doping world, but also to make sure that the vital communication needed for athletes to protect themselves is there in place. I'd also like to thank you all for supporting UCAD's mission. Over the last couple of years, as you know, we've been moving towards our assurance framework. That's now underway and we'll see the early results of that later this year. But that couldn't take place without the engagement of you all. And we do recognise this is a very different and a novel approach over recent anti-doping measures. You'll hear more about the assurance framework in due course, but I'm really pleased that uh, of the reception that it's had so far, and as I say, all of your engagement. Alongside that, we've had a, a busy 12 months. We've developed our new strategy for 21-2025, and I'm going to have the opportunity just to pick up some highlights on that 
after um, our next speaker. So today's sessions will cover off the reflections about Tokyo from an athlete and a doping control perspective. We're gonna talk about the insurance framework, um, the challenges of working in anti-doping in the COVID pandemic, and then just signpost some of the things which are gonna be bringing, we're gonna be bringing forward to tomorrow. First though, I'd just like to extend my thanks to the Minister of Sport, Nigel Huddleston. He can't be with us today, but he has uh, prepared for us presentation which he'd like you all to to see. Um, I have to say the Minister is a massive supporter of UCAD and what we do and the nature of clean sport as well as I know sport in general for the UK. So I'm going to pass over to his recorded message to start our Clean Sport Forum 2021. Thank you for inviting me to open UCAD's 2021 Clean Sport Forum. This conference provides a fantastic opportunity to reflect and celebrate some of the recent accomplishments in sport and anti-doping, and to prepare for some of the milestones that lie ahead of us. I'm thrilled to kick off this event, and for the next two days, there's an opportunity for you all to come together for a series of fascinating webinars on key topics in sport and anti-doping. The fight to make sure that sport is clean is of huge significance in the UK and internationally. It not only maintains the integrity of sport, but it also protects the health and safety of our athletes, which is paramount. It's absolutely right that sporting success is purely a result of hard work, determination and respect for the rules. And UCAD plays an essential role in ensuring that this is the case. As you will all know, the fight for clean sport is a shared responsibility, one which the government, UCAD and all sports shoulder together. I'm incredibly proud of what we have achieved so far and would like to take a moment to reflect on that. This year, the government, having worked closely with UCAD and the sports sector, published the new national anti-doping policy, which sets out the roles and obligations for sports bodies in the UK to ensure adequate anti-doping measures are in place. To complement that, UCAD created an assurance framework specifically designed for national governing bodies of sport to help them fulfil their anti-doping obligations under the new policy. UCAD has also released its new 2021-25 strategy, which has put innovation and data at the forefront of its approach to anti-doping. In spite of all the obstacles caused by COVID, UCAD has maintained a stellar education campaign and has been able to run virtual events like this for the benefit of everyone involved in sport and anti-doping. All of this is done to ensure that our athletes and those working with them are supported to meet their obligations when it comes to anti-doping. Our incredible elite athletes are one of our nation's greatest success stories. I can safely say that we, as a nation, are all so proud of Team GB and Paralympics GB and what they've accomplished at the 2020 Tokyo Games. I was lucky, lucky enough to be in Tokyo to witness some of their extraordinary achievements, including witnessing Dame Sarah Story become our most decorated Paralympian of all time. Team GB, of course, won 65 medals at the Olympic Games, which earned them fourth place and Paralympics GB won 124 medals at the Paralympics, finishing at a truly remarkable second place in the medals table. And our Olympic and Paralympic performance at the Summer Games has cemented our place as a leading nation in global elite sport, and it's inspired people across the country and indeed the world. The success of our athletes and their support staff is a credit to their resilience, dedication, and talent, as well as UK sports brilliant work supporting them. However, the UK sporting success is only possible as a, as a result of the anti-doping efforts led by UCAD and the actions of everyone involved in sport to maintain its integrity. British athletes have an exciting sporting calendar ahead of them. As we turn to focus on the 2022 Beijing Winter Olympic and Paralympic Games, and the 2022 Birmingham Commonwealth Games, anti-doping must remain at the forefront of our preparations. 
I'm very pleased to see that with the close collaboration of sports organisations, UCAD has recently announced its new Clean Games policy. This demonstrates a unified approach with sport to use education to promote clean sport ahead of major games. I'm delighted that the government has committed to providing £232 million to support Team GB and Paralympics GB preparations for Paris 2024. And this funding will help our athletes achieve similar success in Paris as we achieved in Tokyo. And clean sport is absolutely worth fighting for and the government will continue to ensure that that is a priority. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank you all for the effort that you have dedicated to the fight for clean sport. And I look forward to our continued collaboration. I wish you all the very best for future sporting competitions, and I hope that you enjoy the rest of the conference. Okay, thank you. And thanks to the Minister for finding the time to, to give that very positive encouragement to us all. Um, I'm going to take possibly 10 or 15 minutes, um, less if I can, so if there are any questions I can pick up on them, just to talk about the UCAD 2021 to 2025 strategy. Um, I'm sure I don't need to go into this in too much detail because no doubt it is absolute bedside reading for you and it sits on your bedside table for you to refer to at all times. Uh, and we did have the opportunity to consult with many of you last year when we were looking at the, uh, the direction that we felt we needed to take in light of a number of factors which were, were coming down the road for us. Funding, changes to the wider code, changes to the science and technology and looking at how new opportunities have, um, have developed and how we should maximise them. So I'm just going to run through some highlights from that and say if there are any questions that anyone wants to pick up on then please join in. So very quickly uh, the overview. Um, a simple vision, sport is clean and we see our mission uh, to protect sport from doping cheats and that's not a mission that we own specifically because we all have an absolute role to play in that as, as you all well know and as you are well able to do through the influence of your particular roles across sport. So um, that's the overview purpose. And again, I won't go through this, but we're here to protect clean sport. We do it through education, testing and enforcement. None of those are particularly unique. How we, how we cut across and how we develop an operating model that takes account of our education, our testing, our intelligence and our enforcement roles uh, is a much more of a challenge for us internally. Uh, but undoubtedly, the keeping all of those plates running or spinning at the right uh, time and together is an important facet to how we bring forward the whole of the strategy and what we're seeking to do. Um, central to that, though, is about our understanding of the doping threat, because if we don't know what the threat is, how do we know how to react? And I'll perhaps pick up on that a little bit later. And then on broader integrity issues, we don't see that we are specifically um, into a broader set of integrity remits, but there is a clear crossover between anti-doping and sport and some other integrity threats. So just taking us through the highlights of our strategic objectives. Um, firstly, we are a regulator. We are required to comply on behalf of the UK and to ensure compliance on behalf of the UK with the national anti doping policy and the world anti-doping code and that is absolutely fundamental to what we must do regulatory failure would be a significant failure for us so we've got to do that we need as i say to really enhance our insight about what's going on in doping and the threats to clean sport in the uk and globally and i will pick up on that in more detail We've got to improve the way we regulate, the way we deliver on how we translate the World Anti-Doping Code, how we operate through the National Anti-Doping Policy into our engagement with sports and others who we, we uh, share the responsibility with. And that's about making sure that the assurance framework, how we operate our relationships are important. And one key issue for us at the moment is 
have we got the right powers and are we operating in the right environment to ensure the most effective discharge of that responsibility that we have in relation to the WADA code. And finally, um, and I'll pick up on this, is about the uh, data analytics and the importance of that. Um, we know that um, you know, data is really prevalent across all the sport, but how can we use that to make sure that we're putting our effort into the areas where we are gonna optimize success? So just to pick up on those in slightly more detail, starting with an insight. Um, what I, I have always had a view that collectively, and I mean you as well as us in UK, really do have a good knowledge of doping and sport and the threats. What we haven't always done is turn ourselves upside down and shake out that knowledge, get it into one place, and to, um, to really, I suppose, for the starting point, write it down. And then to look at the areas, well, where don't we know the full picture? Particularly, are there technology innovations? Are there pharmaco pharmacological innovations? Is there information coming from social science research that we need to bring forward? And how do we, as UCAD, bring that forward? Uh, we've got an innovations commission, which we set up a couple of years ago, chaired by Dr. Francis Acor, who's one of our board members, where we've brought together a number of very prominent academics across a range of fields to really go out and start to scope what is going on in the environment, what research is there out there, and how might that have some kind of utility to dealing with doping in sport. And then what we want to be able to do is to share that uh, information with sport, with government, academia, the public, etc., to help them understand the environments in which we're operating and what they potentially need to do to um, make things better for their own organisation, limit the threats to their own sports people, and to protect the public and public health more broadly. So what we want to do is to produce an annual theme, annual report, the themes are, that are uh, emerging from doping in sport and some perhaps specific ass um, assessments. We'd like to be in a position to stimulate the research agenda with um, interested parties. Part of the challenge there we absolutely recognise is how do we get funding for the research which we would like to see done. Clearly some research is already underway, but to stimulate new research, we do need to have the funding. And we're exploring opportunities of strategic partnerships with universities. How can we go out into the commercial sector? How can we go out and seek sponsorship for key projects and programmes that we're interested in? and provide the opportunity for those who want to research around this area to know that their research can be really helpful in developing practical outcomes. And I know that for many academics, that's really central to what they want to do now. So how we, how we fund it is going to be probably a much more significant challenge than identifying the research areas and engaging with the partners to do the research. But my final point on this is that it's all very well to have all of the intelligence and the insight and the research in the world, but you've got to be able to do something with it. So how do we turn that knowledge, understanding and intelligence into practical applications which help us in our anti-doping endeavours, whether they're around testing, dried blood stop spots is a good example, but importantly, how, how they're about education. How do I, we identify pathways into doping? How do we identify diversion activities and how do we work with others to set in place the right communication tools to make sure that we influence people and we deter them from behavior which could compromise them and their sports through doping. So a really interesting program to run for, for the life of our strategy and one that clearly we're interested in hearing from you about and from your potential engagement in many of these areas. So the next um, new and different strategic objective is around data. Um, in a different life, I had a, a colleague, probably about 10 years, 12 years ago now, who said the answers in the data, um, as neither he nor I had any form of background in data, uh, computing, machine learning, or anything like that, it was a bit of a bold statement to, to make. But actually, I think he was absolutely right. Uh, we shouldn't be surprised, any of us, at the volume of data which is held 
Uh, and you know, certainly just watching a rugby match on a Saturday afternoon, when you start to see the performance data, which comes onto the screen, you realize just the volume that there is. But for us, um, how do we make use of all of that information which is out there to better inform what we do? So to make sure that the limited resources and potentially increasingly li limited resources that we have are focused on the areas of key threat where we really do need to focus our attention, whether it's in terms of testing, further intelligence collection, or importantly, education. So we need to understand what data we hold, the information that's available to us, but also within our data strategy, what data is out there. Uh, and alongside that, of course, there are some really important components. So what, what in terms of data is it proportionate for us to look at? Um, how are we compliant with our data protection obligations? What are the, the human rights applications of this that we need to be very aware of? So it's not just a question of the noughts and ones. It's very much a question of where does this fit, fit within what we do? Where does it fit ethically in what we do? And how does it absolutely help us in our mission? That's not a skill set that we have particularly in-house, although we've got some people who can really help us as we progress it. But so we need to work with partners to identify how best to use automation, technology and data analytics. And I'm delighted that we've just brought on board a new board member um, to, to UCAB who has got real experience across government in putting in data analytic answers. So we need to understand all of those elements. We need to consider how we would work with a range of partners, strategic partners. And we've had to gain some early conversations with, with academic institutions about this. And we've got to make sure that we can pre prepare a robust business case to support this and our data ambitions. And that's not just the pounds, shillings and pence of what this is gonna cost because there will be a cost to it. And it's a cost and a program that we'll have to run across the life of our strategy. But fundamentally it is put in place to reassure you the justifications about the ethical way in which this will be approached. So this is important and it's different. The, the last point on the screen really also points to the fact that if we get ahead in the UK of these developments, there is some thinking going on in WADA, but not a significant amount. It enables us to develop the UK position and it enables us to develop the intellectual property, which we can then provide to other anti-doping organizations around the world. And that gives us the opportunity to pull back some of our costs, but importantly, it, it sets the UK out as what I and the UK board want to see. You know, a leading national anti-doping organisation that is thinking beyond the issue of just testing, education and uh, results management to really providing an understanding and an environment where we can use a range of tools to make sure that sport in the UK, sport across the world is as free from the doping threat as we possibly can make it. So it's going to be an interesting four years as we deliver on this. And, and I will be delighted to pick up any comments now or to pick up on any feedback um, after this event. Please feel free to let us know your thoughts on any of these areas and how you and your organisation can collaborate with us. Charlie, um, I'm back to you for questions and answers. Yes, indeed. And thank you very much indeed, Trevor. That's a fascinating um, little update on, um, on our plans for the next, uh, next years to come. Uh, we've had a couple of questions that have come through, Trevor. So maybe I'll just... I'll, I'll bring those straight to you. Uh, one is around um, powers, and um, which is, does UCAD have enough powers and uh, regulatory authority to complete its job? Which sounds quite direct, but I'll, I'll, pass, I'll pass that to you, Sam, to, to work out how you answer that. Okay, um, a, a direct question is as a direct answer. Um, I don't think so. Um, and I think um, you, UCAD operates without broadly a statutory virus. So the national anti-doping policy and the, the fact that the Secretary of State some time ago, a number of Secretary of States ago signed the UK up to the UNESCO convention really give us our operating uh, environment. There are things where, which we do do, and we have to do by virtue of our obligation under code, where you could question whether we do engage the, the private lives of our athletes, 
for a particular example. And therefore, I want to be absolutely sure that in terms of what we do, that we, we do that within a, a legal framework and the proper protections are in place. So in terms of uh, you know, the intelligence that we gather and hold, is that being done within a proper, a proper framework? You know, ditto how we, we speak to those who want to report doping in sport. Um, and, and also the, the question of whether there is a requirement for us to be able to go into particular sporting venues without notice and to carry out testing. So there are a range of things where, where we're starting to do some thinking, we're taking advice from leading counsel, but I think there is a need to make sure that we move towards um, an identifiable framework by which we can carry out our powers out with those which, which are set within the um, national anti-doping policy um, and might be described in some respects as more contractually based. So we know that, for instance, ITA um, or the AIU have contractual arrangements which enable them to act in particular ways. Is that a model for us or are there different models? So we're currently speaking with DCMS and Home Office to work out how that comes in play. Okay, thank you very much, Trevor. And we talked about the exciting areas um, in terms of research and innovation that could be coming our way, especially uh, as that's now built into, uh, into the UK anti strategy. Uh, on a personal note, uh, this question, uh, which research areas are you most excited about? Oh, cracking. Um, as someone who was uh, kicked out of chemistry in uh, what would now be the equivalent of year nine, um, certainly some of the ph pharmacology goes way beyond me. I think the real, the real interest areas are um, what can we do with data to understand the, the threat more broadly? And I'm genuinely interested in some of the social science research around how can we use influence from what we know to change and divert those who are on potential pathways to doping. So that's probably to the younger cohort. It links into the education sphere, but actually are we using the right techniques and tools to really make people question whether if you're gonna go left or right, we make sure they go left down the clean pathway. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, so we are going to move on to our, our next session, but um, um, thank you very much indeed, Trevor. I'm going to take the opportunity as well just to uh, plug the new uh, research um, function at UCAD. So if you are interested in getting involved or getting in touch with the research team at UCAD serving then uh, just head to the UCAD web, uh, website and find the research page. Uh, from there, and you'll be able to pick up the information. Um, I am aware that we have got a, a slight sort of technical glitch, which is a an odd black bar across the top. It might look like we're trying to censor something or screen something out, but uh, uh, trust me, that's not the case. It's just a little bit of a gremlin in the system, and we'll see if we can uh, get that sorted. But uh, thankfully, we have uh, some very engaging speakers who are going to distract you from, from that for our next session. Um, so we are going to move on, and we are delighted to welcome um uh, athletes to to our clean sport forum and um you know we're, we're we're all here to work towards giving athletes the opportunity to to compete in a doping free environment so um who better to hear from uh, than them themselves so uh we're going to have a look back at 2020 um and the the challenges uh that faced athletes there so we're delighted to welcome uh paul, uh, paul karabadek and tom matthews uh, two table tennis stars from uh, from the paralympic games this this summer uh, they're going to be uh, joined by my colleague uh, harriet so over to you harriet and we'll uh, we'll let you guys uh, crack on Thank you, Charlie. So I'm the Stakeholder Communications Manager at UCAD, and over the last 18 months, uh, my experience of lockdown has perhaps been similar to that of many other people. More family time, more food, maybe too much Netflix, and not enough exercise. And it turns out that some of our Paralympians have taken a much more creative approach, and that is why our Welsh para table tennis stars are joining us today to talk about creative solutions um, they used to achieve success at Tokyo 2020. So I'm delighted today to be joined by Paul and Tom, and they're joining us from Cardiff. They've taken a break from their training. And I wonder, Paul, would you like to introduce yourself and talk about your journey to para-table tennis? Hello, my name's Paul Karabadak. I started playing para-table tennis in 2000 after I suffered a stroke at the age of 10 years old. I was taken into the team in 2001 where I 
competed at the European Championships in Frankfurt. This year was 20 years of playing table tennis and I managed to win my first Paralympic medals in Tokyo. That's a magnificent achievement. Now, what about Tom? Your journey into sport has been a little bit different. So can you tell us about your journey? Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tom Matthews. And how I got into table tennis was I had an accident when I was 16 years old. I used to race down in the mountain bikes and uh, I weren't very good at it. I went over the handlebars and uh, broke my neck. And when I was in hospital, a guy who was coming around the wards, he was a Paralympian himself. And the best thing to do in the uh, hospital was table tennis. And um, yeah, I got up and fell in love with the sport and then took it really serious. 2013 was like my first year involved in the internationals. And yeah, it was my first Paralympic Games and come over with a medal. So very proud. As a magnificent achievement. So today we'll look a little bit at how athletes have applied their claim sport values to the uh, extraordinary conditions the pandemic produced. And at UK, we run a values-based education program which starts with 100% me. And the values are um, passion, respect, integrity, determination, and enjoyment. And uh, they're the foundation of the program. And those values, are, as an acronym spelled PRIDE, and then our, our athletes are so successful that they will have had Clean Sport 1 and Clean, and Clean Sport 2 workshops. And in that time, they will have covered um, governance, uh, strict liability, supplements, medications, uh, testing, TUEs, the consequences um, of uh, doping, uh, ADRVs, et cetera. But that's not enough. So because uh, these two athletes were on <laughs> the pathway to the games, they will have also had Clean Games education. And in that case, it's specific uh, sessions of education for the anti-doping rules for the major games, which of course was Tokyo 2020, and uh, looking at the anti-doping rules that were relevant to that event. But it, and it, uh, in the case of UCAD, uh, the, Turkey, the education was uh, delivered as a travel guide, um, and it was a sort of an example that uh, if you were sort of uh, traveling around, you also, you know, how you'd use the prohibited list, uh, global drug to help with medications, etc. And I think that we might start with just we go back to the preparation for Tokyo. And I know that you received some unusual deliveries because for anybody getting exercise at home was hard work. So what happened for you when lockdown started? So it was all a bit crazy, really. Um, Sport Wales in Cardiff, they had tables delivered to our houses which was a bit nuts. Luckily, I've got a girlfriend who I think to tell me I couldn't have it. So uh, I had enough room for the table. And then we had robots delivered. So what a robot is, I don't know if I've ever watched tennis or baseball. It's basically a machine that just shoots the ball from the other side of the table. And that's what we used throughout the pandemic to keep, carry on our training through Zoom calls. And we had like um, strength and conditioning. Um, yeah, we managed really well as a team, to be honest. Amazing. And um, is it, what, what happened? Were your family bothered? Was your, was your girlfriend desperate to get a chance with the, the robot as well? Or is everyone just absolutely okay with letting you have the, you know, the living room or wherever? No, so I, I live on my own. Um, like I said, I haven't got a girlfriend, so I didn't have anyone to tell me that I couldn't have it. Oh, so I see, I see. That, okay. That was the okay. good part about it all, to be honest. I had no one to tell me that I can't uh, fit a table in my house. So, but yeah, it all went well, to be fair. It was good. And Paul, what about you? It can't be easy, um, like just if you're practicing at home. What about uh, coaching? How did that work? Uh, it was good because all the coaches joined on the Zoom call so they could watch you play and they could give you give you coaching. So so that was good. And then all the other players were also linked up on the Zoom call. They were playing on their robots. So it was all good with that. Okay, and did you have the opportunity to be part of a bubble? Were you able to meet teammates at all over the time? Um, not at the oh, sorry, hold on. Not at the not at the start, but then gradually we got back into Sport Wales, where I, I'm in a bubble with Tom and Neil and Robert Davis. So we, the four of us were in the same bubble. So that must make for very strong friendships. Was I, I think that, you know the uh, the pandemic was there such a, there was such a lot of uncertainty and uh, just with the games themselves whether they'd go ahead or not. 
did that um, make it difficult for you guys to, um, to just sort of show your determination and continue training? I think it was really good and I think it made us closer as a team and I think it developed our friendship more and I think that showed within the results in Tokyo as well how strong we were as a team and how much we bonded over that period. So it must have been a very different game. So for you, like, did you find it uh, more difficult without an audience or did you feel that that played to your strengths? Uh, I think it was, I think it suited me. I think it was a lot better because without all the people in there cheering, it wasn't as noisy and I, I didn't feel the pressure and I performed better at Tokyo than I did in my last three Paralympics. So I think it massively helped me, to be honest. That's fantastic. And what about you, for um, Tom, what about for you? Did you find that like, it must have been challenging without an audience in a way that you must have had the opportunity to meet some um, members from the other teams? Yeah, um, obviously when we were in the village, you're allowed to mix with other countries because we were all tested daily. Um, but it was my first Paralympic Games, so I didn't know any different. Um, I've never played in front of a crowd, so Paris might be a bit different, but it suited me down to the ground, to be honest. So do you feel motivated to, uh, can, we, can we hope to see you in Paris? Do you feel, you feel you're ready to train for that, perhaps that shorter year, the three years? Yeah, definitely. Let's go again. Change the colour of the medal this time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that sounds amazing. And so, anyway, with the um, the various education sessions, sessions that you've had over time, um, have you felt that um, they've given you confidence in the, the game situation? Yeah, definitely. And uh, as a sport, I feel like the clean sport aspect of it all, we know we're all clean and that's the main thing for us. Um, obviously, we can't kind of judge what our opponents are doing or anyone else in the world as long as us in Britain know we're under clean sport act and we're all clean that that gives us confidence going into the games. So how did you find the testing um, process? Has that been, uh, it must have been a little bit different from being tested in the UK but do you feel confident in those situations? Yeah 100% confident like I said we follow clean sport guidelines and we've had enough education to go into these things and yeah I feel really confident about it. Okay, okay. And what about um, uh, the preparation you've had for checking your drugs, that kind of thing, for medication? Do you feel confident with the, like the global drug process? Does that suit you? Oh, so, sorry, yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely. It does suit me. Um, and we got like um, a nutritionist. Uh, he kind of sorts out. So I think I can speak for Paul a little bit. He, he takes vitamin D and stuff. Um, and that guy's all checked by our nutritionist. He does all the barcode checks and all that for us and um, to make sure he's in guidelines with informed sport and we're safe to take these things. It's pretty amazing that uh, Sport Wales sorted you out with the table tennis kit and what have you. Did you feel that the preparation standards you have uh, compare favourably to what goes on in other countries? Definitely. I think, I think we had the upper hand. Um, I think we prepared as best we can and that's, that's all we could do. Like you said, we didn't know what our opponents were doing, but we prepared the best we could in the show in Tokyo that we done really well. Yeah, and what about um, Paul for you? Because you, I think this is your fourth Paralympics, which is an amazing achievement. Did you see a lot of difference over the years in terms of the preparation or how you feel like the, you know, the, the level of comfort you have coming from the UK with the training that you've had? Uh, yeah, I, th I think it's brilliant and we're well looked after in every aspect of the uh, we're, everything sorted for us so all our needs are met and I think it, it, it's, it relaxes us to have everyone helping and do, doing their job so we can just focus on our training we don't have to worry about being clean and because everything's sorted and we can just focus on training and going out and giving our best performances it's amazing. So look, in the office, when we're uh, the education team are working on the, the programs and wondering what's been included and what have you, uh, there's often some conversation about the ducks. So I remember when uh, the decision was made in uh, 2012 to use the squeaky duck as an indication or as a reminder, a general reminder in the kitting out process about clean sport. And um, I just wondered, you must have perhaps um, maybe more than one duck by now? Yeah, I don't think I had one for Beijing. I'm not sure they, they were around then, but I've got the three from 
uh, London, Rio, and Tokyo. So, so yeah, I've got quite. Say, do you find uh, yes, they do find you a good symbol? They're they're a good reminder. They they, they bring the I can see they bring a smile to your face. Yeah, I think I think it's a really good idea, and I think it's a good symbol for for athletes just to stay clean and not take performance enhancing drugs. I think it's it's a really good symbol just to train hard and do your best without having the aid of anything illegal. Amazing, amazing. So when what do you feel um, are the, um, the, what's the advice you might give to some younger athletes who are just starting out in their journey? Um, I think the, the biggest bit of advice is to enjoy it just in, enjoy your experiences of competing because it's a short career and it won't last forever and there will be a lot of tough times but you've got to just keep fighting on love love what you do and enjoy it and, and always give your best always give a hundred percent and ne never give up and just just try your best really and enjoy it Thank you. It's, a, it's an amazing thing that you might say it's a short career because tw 20 years is, is pretty phenomenal with competing at the level that you have reached. Are you looking forward to uh, Paris? Uh, yeah, I am. I'm very much looking forward to Paris. I think it's strange because I think I'm, I'm in, I'm, I've improved more now over the last year or so and I'm getting older. I think I've improved more and I think I'm enjoying the game mm -hmm. more. And I think my results in Tokyo have given me confidence. So yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to Paris now, and hopefully achieve, achieving the same great results or trying to get better than I did in Tokyo. It's really inspirational to see that you still have that motivation. It's fantastic. And what about you, Tom? What what will drive you through getting ready for Paris? I, I just enjoy competing, like Paul said. It's, um, just got to enjoy the whole experience. And um, Tokyo, obviously, be my first games. I really enjoyed the experience. And yeah, I just can't wait for the next one, to be honest. Um, I can't wait to compete again. And that's the main thing for me. I'm enjoying competing. I'm enjoying training. I'm enjoying life, really. So, yeah, I, I can't really complain. Okay, okay, that's amazing. And uh, is there anything you'd like to talk about in terms of... Um, the, after the preparation in the UK, did you have the opportunity to compete before Tokyo? Did you have no, a trip to Slovenia? Or? We've done a trip to Slovenia, but it was like a training camp. Um, we had some other countries come in um, in Slovenia and we got to train against other people. Played, done some match play kind of situations, so that really helped before going out. And obviously, again, the kind of flying aspect of the way, so doing all the COVID tests before we went out and doing them to come back home, that really helped. Um, obviously, because if we hadn't done that before going out to Tokyo, it would have been the first time going on the flight to Tokyo. It would have been a bit difficult just to jump on that flight without knowing what the protocols were, really. So you mentioned that you're tested every day. But so when you're actually in the in the um, the host city, did you feel comfortable? Did you feel that the uh, the way it was set up was what sort of inspired your confidence as athletes in that environment? Yeah, definitely. I felt it was done perfectly. Um, I actually felt safer there than I did back in the UK. Um, and that's no disrespect to the UK, but knowing every athlete they was getting tested, you, you just knew you were safe. Okay, and 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 for now, are you back into training already? Yeah, back into full time training. Started back this week. Uh, me and Paul are in the gym like a week earlier, just to kind of shake off them loose ends and get back to it this week and crack on to Paris. Okay, and have you got a competition coming up, like on the horizon, or is it too soon for that sort of thing to be set with the restrictions? It's looking like next year. Um, we're waiting for the calendar to come out at the moment. But it'll probably be March next year around that, by that time, I think. And do you, and do you have, like, you must have, uh, there must be occasions when you do need to take extra medication. Do you have any anxieties around taking medication or supplements? Um, or do you feel comfortable with um, the, the situation you have with your coaches or your nutritionist looking after everything? I feel very comfortable with people looking after if anything changes. We search up on Global Draw. Um, if there's any questions about it, we just research it. Um, if there's any problem, we can always uh, ask you, Card, and they'll give the advice on it. Brilliant, brilliant. So, and what about you? Do you have any advice that you would like to give to uh, people who, who are just starting their journey into Paralympic sport? 
Um, same as Paul, really. Just enjoy it. Um, I think I started off. I put a bit too much pressure on myself. Um, I think it's just live life today and just enjoy the experience. Enjoy what you're doing. You get you get a few shots here, so just enjoy yourself. Brilliant, brilliant. That is excellent advice. So, is there anything else that you'd like to add at this stage in terms of uh, inspiring people or uh, anything that was particularly different with lockdown or, and the the games as they were? Anything else you'd like to share at this point? Um, just never give up. Even if you're struggling, please talk to someone. Um, if you need help with anything, just reach out. And that's why I'd say don't struggle to yourself. Reach out to people because they're willing there to help. And um, yeah, just enjoy life. That's excellent advice. And what about you, Paul? Because I think it's yeah you know, with lockdown and training in these unusual circumstances, it has required extra determination. Do you have any words you'd like to add? Um, I think I think like when something gets taken away from you, like. I couldn't go training anymore due to lockdown and I really, really miss table tennis and I really miss going to the gym. So when when restrictions eased and I could do all of that, I really, really enjoyed it and I felt more love for going to the gym and more love for table tennis than I'd ever felt before. So I just think people should maybe appreciate what they've got and don't take things for granted and always love and enjoy what you do, really. That's excellent advice. And can I ask, when you started out, who were your sporting heroes? Who did you admire when you were just starting out in your journey? Um, well, my coach, Neil Robinson's a fantastic player and he's won a lot. So I really admired him. And then obviously top Olympians like Chris Hoy, and uh, Mo Farah, Andy Murray, but not just for what they achieved, for the people they are as well and the way they conduct themselves and the way they carry themselves and the way they go about things is also a massive inspiration to me. I think you yourself are a role model for many of us. It's an extraordinary journey that you have um, undergone and I think we're delighted that you've been able to join us today. And what about you, Tom? Have you had any particular heroes that you've looked up to in your journey? Definitely Neil Robinson again. He's done, I think it was his 10th Paralympics this one. So you got to look up to him, go to admire what he's done. Um, and another guy called Jim Monkley used to be a Paralympian, sadly passed away now. But without that guy, I wouldn't have started. So it was a massive um, thing to him. But, uh, yeah, without him, I wouldn't be where I am. So there's a, it's a lot that goes to him. Um, but role models in the public eye, I'd probably say probably the likes of Tyson Fury and Anthony Joshua, just the people they are um, out of the ring, really, and especially after Tyson winning this weekend. i got to bring up his name because more of a normal comeback. And that shows the never die attitude. He got up off the floor and won the fight. So Determination, again, one of those 100% me values. Okay. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you both. It's been amazing having you join us today and share your experience. And it just is really uplifting for the UK staff to hear the journey of the athletes because uh, it's an organization full of sports fans so it's wonderful to hear firsthand what your experience has been of uh, sport in action well thank you very much and thanks for all the work you do behind the scenes appreciate it well thank you you're welcome thank you very much thanks paul it's our pleasure thank you bye 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 that's great. Thank you very much indeed, guys. And thank you, Harriet, for uh, doing the Dimbleby uh, moment there for us all. So uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's been really fascinating and fine to hearing how things went over in Tokyo this summer, much anticipated and long overdue. So um, I bet those guys are desperate to get out there and compete. So uh, really great to hear from them. So we're going to move on to our next session. And it's something that's already been touched upon uh, a couple of times already by the minister and also Trevor Pierce in the kickoff uh, at the uh, the top of the uh, the program today. Um, and it's all about UCAN's assurance framework and how we um, how we uh, work with sports to implement that. And we'd like to welcome uh, Paul Loosley, who's the head of assurance from UCAN Sterling, who's also joined by Karen Roberts from British Judo. So I'm going to hand over to Paul first, and uh, we're, we're looking forward to hearing from you. Thanks.
Thanks very much, Charlie. Um, I've just shared my screen, so hopefully you can all see that okay, and there aren't any gremlins in my computer at least. So, um, as Charlie mentioned, so my name is Paul Loosley and I'm the Head of Assurance at UCAD. And today I'm going to be talking about antidoping governance in the UK and a new compliance framework that was introduced earlier this year. And then I'm pleased to say that we're also joined by Karen Roberts, who's the Head of Performance at the British Judo Association, who's going to be talking you through their experience of implementing the new responsibilities that now lie with NGBs in the UK. Um, before I start, I should say I know compliance and assurance is not always the most glamorous of subjects, but hopefully I'll be able to highlight how important we see it as at UCAD and what a big impact it can have on clean sport. So, as Nigel and Trevor both mentioned earlier, in the absence of specific anti-doping legislation in the UK, the primary way in which anti-doping is governed is via the UK National Anti-Doping Policy or as we refer to it just as the policy. So first introduced in 2009, the policy is owned by the UK government and devolved administrations, and it ensures that the UK meets its obligations under the UNESCO Convention Against Doping in Sport. So when the policy was first launched, these organisations listed here all had their responsibilities set out which as you can see includes UCAD, NGVs and sports councils. And UCAD is set as the custodian of the policy. So that means that we've got responsibility for managing the content and managing the day-to-day -day operational implementation of the policy. So over the last few years, we've been working very closely with the UK government to revise the policy. And a new version was launched in April of this year. And as well as updating all of the responsibilities for these organisations, there were several new organisations that also signed up to the new policy. And those are all listed here in red. So some of these organisations listed here, as you may know, including the UCAD, are direct signatories to the World Anti-Saving Code. So we and they have their responsibilities set out by WADA and WADA do monitor those responsibilities. However, some of the organisations, including NGVs and sports councils, are not direct signatories to the World Anti-Doping Code. So the policy acts as a way of pulling everything together into one cohesive document. And alongside the UK Anti-Doping Rules, it also ensures that the World Anti-Doping Code is implemented at a UK level across all of these different organisations. So for NGVs specifically, Compliance with the policy is linked to not only their ability to send a team to a major games, but also the funding that they receive from UK sports councils. And given their role and their link to athletes and athlete support personnel on a daily basis, we believe that they play a really pivotal role in the fight against doping and can have a huge influence on the culture of clean sport. So because of that, in April this year, as Trevor mentioned, we also launched an assurance framework, which is specifically for NGVs. And I'm now going to talk to you through that in a little bit more detail. So what actually is the assurance framework? So the assurance framework is a series of requirements that all national governing bodies need to meet in order to evidence to UCAD that they are compliant with the new national anti-doping policy. So this includes a minimum standards that they need to meet to be compliant, and then ways in which they can then take their anti-doping programs to the next level. So to put the assurance framework requirements together, UCAD consulted extensively with NGBs across the UK of different sizes, structures and resources. Um, I'll be honest, it was a real challenge to try and create one set of requirements that fit with NGBs of all different varieties and shapes and sizes. But we've aimed to achieve that by building proportionality and flexibility into the application of the requirements. So the consultation that we did was initially done on an individual basis with a group of around 20 NGVs, in which we talked to them in detail about how the framework would be applied and got to hear some of the challenges that they might encounter in implementing them. We then held a series of briefings that were aimed at NGB chief executives and chairs that was across the UK, and that was in March 2020, 
literally just finished, I think, a week before lockdown started. So both of these consultations enabled us to get some really valuable feedback on the potential assurance framework requirements and what would work, what wouldn't work. And we incorporated all of those feedbacks into the final set of requirements and the guidance document. I just wanted to touch briefly on what the framework requirements look like, so what we are asking NGBs to do. So there are 24 requirements in total to meet. So they start with a group that we've defined as organization and governance. So responsibilities here include the need to nominate a lead for antidoping within their organization and a lead on the board. And for both of those individuals, we've created specific e-learning programs to support them in those new roles. We are also asking NGBs to discuss antidoping at board level at least once a year. And the board engagement is a real focus for UCAD because we understand the impact that board can have across the sport in setting the culture, which will then hopefully filter down throughout the organization. The second series of responsibilities relate to legal. So a big one here is ensuring that NGBs have got anti-doping rules in place, and then ensuring that those rules are binding on athletes and athlete support personnel that participate in that sport. And that obviously allows UCAD to take action against individuals where there is a breach of those anti-doping rules. The third section is all about education. So a key one here is we're asking NGBs to put in place an education strategy and a plan that maps out how they're going to educate and communicate anti-doping messages to athletes and their athlete support personnel. And the rationale behind that is to assure that the education that is being delivered to those individuals is tailored, it's specific to the, the target audience, and it builds up over time as that individual's career progresses. Next series of responsibilities are linked to communication. So a big one here is ensuring that each NGB's website contains relevant anti-doping information and signposting so that athletes and athlete support personnel know where to go and also communicating key messaging to those individuals so a prime example being the changes that are made every year to the prohibited list by WADA. Next series of responsibilities relates to intelligence and investigations so here we're asking NGBs to continue sharing any intelligence with UCAD about possible doping and utilizing their disciplinary regulations to take action against individuals within their sport where the need arises. And the final section is around testing. So UCAD run an independent testing program, which is completely separate from sport. So NGBs don't know who we're testing, where and when, but they do play a key role in informing those test plans. So providing information that we can then review, consider, and target athletes as needed. So the final slide for me, I guess, is a brief summary of where we are now. So the framework launched in April this year, as I mentioned, and since then we've been working hard to support sports and NGBs as they work through the new requirements and embed them within the organization. So this initially involved the creation and provision of lots of support and resources, so example wording and guidance to try and take them through all the requirements and how they can be implemented. It's also featured one-to-one -one support sessions where we go through everything in more detail. And our education team at UCAD have been running various workshops. So one on how to create an education strategy and a plan, and another specifically designed to support NGB board members with their roles. So we're also going to be working very closely with sports councils to ensure that NGBs have all the support they need over the coming months and trying to encourage NGBs to work together, particularly within the same sport, to share, share best practice and challenges. The ultimate aim of the assurance framework is to try and create a structure for NGBs through which they can develop their anti-doping programs. And we're hoping that if they start meeting these requirements, that will then 
help to change behaviours and actions within the individuals participating in the sport. And principally, that's for the benefit of athletes and athlete support personnel, but also for the wider public, so they've got confidence in the sport they're watching. So that's it from me. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Karen Roberts, who, as I mentioned, is the head of performance at British Judo Association. So British Judo have been making some excellent program progress with the assurance framework, as Taryn will talk you through, um, and nearly fully compliant with all the new requirements. So Taryn has kindly agreed to talk through their experience to date and some of their lessons learned. And then hopefully we'll have time for some questions afterwards. So I should have stopped sharing and I'll now hand over to Karen. Thanks, Paul. Um, Paul, if you could give me uh, a thumbs up, if you can see that, that'd be helpful. Brilliant. Great. Um, thank you for inviting me along. I was a little bit surprised um, because probably like many of the people on this call, um, you get stuck in your own little bubble and you're focused on the work at hand, but you don't actually know how you're progressing. So it was, it was nice to hear that we were progressing well. Um, and that we'd be a useful case study to use. Um, I, I'm going to go through this quite quickly. Um, like Paul started off, it's not the most exciting topic, but hopefully I'll bring it to life a little bit by our own personal experiences. Just for those of you that don't know um, much about British Judo, um, we are the, the nas national governing body for judo in this country, and we're recognised by the International Federation and the NOC um, as the NGB with responsibility for judo. Uh, we are an Olympic and a Paralympic sport, and we've got a membership organisation of about 40,000. That does include our home nations as well, which are Judo Scotland, Northern Ireland Judo, Northern Ireland Judo Federation and the Welsh Judo Association. And we also then amongst our English um, contingent have English areas that are part of British Judo. Um, as British Judo, we are funded by UK Sport and Sport England primarily, and we also have a membership income. But as Paul alluded to, with, with one of the requirements of receiving that government funding, it's absolutely critical that we were compliant um, with the assurance framework. And I think like anybody who is joining this forum, nobody would not want to be. Um, it's just making sure that we've got the right um, information in place. Um, so my role, um, many, many years ago, um, I was an athlete. Um, and whilst I was an athlete, I was um, a 100% me ambassador. And then once I took on the role, um, uh, with it within British Judo as uh, back then performance operations manager, um, I was the performance contact to UCAD. So I had a bit of a background um, in this topic. I then have uh, gone on to become an NGB educator and for my sins and now the NGB lead, which is why this has fallen on my plate. Um, the key thing I, I guess I want to sort of say from this slide is actually I, I'm my role, if, if we look at my title is head of performance operations. And I would imagine it'd be similar in other organizations that this has been something that has now been included in my role rather than a standalone. Um, and that's important when we consider the resource required um, to work with this, this topic. So I feel like I should be honest. Um, in the beginning, that was probably my face. So I'm thinking back to March, 2020, just before that lockdown. And I was sat in the room um, at the last conference that we had in person. Um, and the first uh, things that I heard were things like 24 requirements, um, organization and governance uh, and legal requirements. And I was extremely apprehensive. And, and one of my colleagues were in the room with me um, and we did have a lot of uh, overwhelming feelings about how do we, how do we even start this? Where, where do we begin? Um, so where did we start? But at the time we were trying to be superhuman, I think is, is uh, probably fair to say, and there were three of us, we were the power of three in our steering group. Um, that re re represented performance in myself, our pathway and our sports directorate, but we actually realized that that definitely wasn't the way forward. Um, within our judo community, we've got lots of great people. So the first, the first step of our um, starting process was to bring those people around the table. Uh, so we went out to our home nations that I've already mentioned, and we went to our board and we explained what um, was coming up over the next 12 to 18 months. And we wanted to know who would be involved. We went about it that way around um, rather than demanding people be involved, because what we found was if people wanted to be around the table, they would readily contribute. Um, it, a lot of this was by accident, not by design, but that has then really helped us create a strong steering group um, to keep talking about how we move. 
um, clean, clean judo forward in the future, but also um, how we approach the assurance framework. And we actually did start that off with the, the SWOT analysis amongst ourselves. Like I said, every area of our organization was represented in the steering group. And that provided a, a, a great place for us um, to really think about what's the work that needs to be done um, and, and where can we go to do that. The other important part was um, what I identified last March in 2020 was there was going to be a lot of support and a lot of resource out there for us as a smaller NGV to harness. Um, and it was a matter of keeping on top what was available and making sure at least one of the steering group could be there to, to take that information forwards. Um, I can't speak highly enough of the, the workshops, uh, different templates that have been available, um, and also the offer of the, the one-to-ones uh, back through the summer uh, with both the assurance team and the education team. Uh, that was invaluable, not necessarily to necessarily um, give us anything new once we were undergoing the process, but just to reassure and sense check that we were on the right track. Um, so I think my, my biggest my biggest take home has been use the resource that's been that's available rather than trying to be that superhuman and, and doing it all ourselves. So once we actually got stuck into this, the reality of the situation was very different to that first picture of apprehension. Actually, we did a lot of what we needed to be able to evidence um, and we just needed to find that information and put it in a way that um, we could keep referring back to. Anything that we weren't doing um, actually really served as best practice and actually has served as um, a stimulus for change and to make sure that we do include it in our day-to-day -day work in the future. And then there was kind of a third section, which was just about refreshing um, and revamping some of the things that we've, we've done in the past. And um, that, that really, I guess, as an example, would be our website and thinking about how we've used that resource in the past. So actually the reality of the situation, I think I'd liken it to the good old days of when you're given um, an essay to write and being very overwhelmed at the start. But once we started to get stuck into it, we actually realized there was a lot of great work already done um, and we just needed to harness that. Um, so at the end of the process, well, we're not quite there yet, but we're, we're closer to the end of the process for this year. Um, and um, that emoji probably does describe where we are with it now. And the reason isn't because we're near the end of it, it it's actually because it's provided a really use, useful scaffolding for us um, to pull together the work that was happening um, and also create some, some new work and best practice for us as an organization. Um, this is exactly where we are now um, as an NGB. Um, I actually pulled that off of the, um, the platform yesterday. Um, we have just been in our board meeting this morning discussing anti-doping, so um, I'm hoping to submit those board minutes very soon and shift that green bar up further. And then the other bit of amber on there is our education strategy and um, plan, which has been through review um, and we've received the first feedback uh, from the education team who have been really incredible in supporting um, our development of that plan. Um, and that's now resubmitted and, and um, back for um, checking towards compliance. So we're hoping we're, we're on, on the right track. I think um, one, of, one of the things as we move forward and um, rather than seeing this as a chore to do, I'm hoping that everyone will find themselves in this space, is that because we are a very small NGB with very, very finite um, resource for this space, this scaffolding, this checklist has meant that we can stay focused and that we can really put um, our efforts into the right places. And rather than being reactive, hopefully this will now mean that it gives us the capacity to be proactive um, moving forwards. And already we've identified that probably over the next two years, we already have networks within our NGB, such as our club welfare officers and our pe uh, fantastic parent um, uh, network that is out there and how can we actually harness that in supporting our um, clean judo mo motion uh, uh, in, the, in the years to come. So by going through the assurance uh, framework process, it's not only helped us order our thoughts, collect where our work is, um, it's also given us ideas for the future on how we can continue to progress in this space. That was a whistle stop tour of, of our journey so far, um, but please ask any questions that you might have. And then um, thank you for, for listening to me.
Thanks very much, Karen. Um, before we kind of open to the floor, I guess there was a couple of questions I just wanted to ask you. Um, it's obviously clear that you've put in a lot of work to get to this stage and you're very near the finish line. Um, what do you see kind of once you've got past the finish line, what do you see as kind of the main priority over the next year or so now that you've kind of met the requirements? Are there any specific areas that you want to work on and develop further? Well, um, one of the key things is working with our home nations um, over the, the immediate future um, uh, to support them on their process through this. Um, but then beyond that, as a collective, um, really sitting this with the board, I think you mentioned um, in, in your, your um, slides there how important it has been to get that engagement because actually that's where it starts. We're, we're fortunate in that um, judo is based on, on the judo moral code that is the foundation of the sport which sits really closely to clean sport values um, so our board is really passionate about this um, and it's it's been interesting because they've been given the opportunity to be passionate about it so I think um, further engagement with our board um, and the more people that can be involved means it's like to work for everybody um, so the idea over the coming years is to, is to grow that that steering group and actually the ambassadors that are actually sitting in our own school. Brilliant. Um, and kind of link, you kind of touched on it earlier, but I was just interested to know kind of whether you give any advice to NGBs, because one of the things we're conscious of is, and you've touched on it there, is the fact that it can look quite daunting. So <laughs> 24 requirements and a big guidance document. So yes. stop saying it. <laughs> <laughs> stop, I probably saying stop saying that. Yeah. Stop saying the twenty-four No, I think um, don't reinvent the wheel. There'll be great work that you're already doing. Touch base and work out how that fits against the assurance framework. Um, also, use the resource that um, you could have provided. Uh, the templates that are there. That there's no need to to try and find something if if you're looking for it. It's there. Ask the questions. I've, I've found both um, the assurance team and the education team to be extremely useful in terms of putting me on the right track, putting other members of the steering group like on the bits of work they've been working on just in the right kind of scope and then and also being reassuring that just keep going, you're on the right track. So I would use the resource um, that is provided uh, by, by UCAD. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to look to see if any other questions have come through. Um, one that's come through is, how hard has it been to manage this work alongside the other obligations that NGBs have, like safeguarding, for example? And has it been linked to anything? Uh, that, that's a good question. Um, and at the beginning, I was extremely apprehensive. Um, I guess for me, it was what one a silver lining of COVID is that it, I knew every, where everybody was and it was really easy to be able to get this off the ground. Um, it, it is difficult to juggle um, with other pieces of work going on, um, but it's harder to juggle if you're doing it on your own. So using the network across your organisation, um, like I mentioned, colleague uh, in sports director at Dermot, he's a national trainer as well. <laughs> It'd be silly not to, to use that resource that's sitting there. Um, the board of directors, now we've got the board lead, well, actually, um, I'll use that resource. Um, and, and I think that's been the difficulty is that for a long time, I probably took all of the responsibility for it. Um, whereas actually now we, we share that amongst ourselves and um, it means that we can all we can all contribute to the common goal. That's brilliant. I think that's definitely something we're trying to focus on as well. So although we're asking NGBs to nominate a board lead and an anti-doping lead, they, it, everything can't just sit with that one individual. That just, it just doesn't work like that. And even at board level, um, the feedback we've had is whilst there might be a lead responsible, I think it's the whole responsibility of the whole board to talk about and so being to drive that forward. Um, so that's good to hear. Um, and I think maybe one other one that's just come in is have there been any aspects of the framework that you found particularly challenging to implement? No, uh, because I, I think the interesting thing about it is everything that's in there is best practice. So actually, um, if you weren't doing it before, you'd want to be doing it. It probably just wasn't on your radar. Um, in terms of challenging, I guess the only thing is making sure, 
I've gone backwards and forwards a lot of times to make sure the wording is correct. And the this is an area that I'm not definitely an expert, but around the legal aspects of um, at what point at what point um, in a code of conduct would somebody be breaking a rule and which disciplinary policy would that refer to? So connecting everything was probably the challenging part and understanding then from a clean sport point of view that hopefully we're never in the situation, but should something happen where we need to rely on um, our documents and our policies that they would stand up legally. Um, so my understanding of that has probably been the challenge, not actually the work itself. Okay, good, good to hear. Um, I think that is pretty much it in terms of questions. You'll be pleased to know. I don't think there's any for me, which is even better. So uh, <laughs> finally, I just want to say, yeah, thanks very much. Um, congratulations on making so much progress to date. And um, if there are any NGBs that are on the call that are concerned about anything, just get in touch with UCAD, the assurance mailbox, assurance at ucad.org.uk. And we'll talk you through everything and explain everything to you. Um, but yeah, otherwise, thanks very much. And I'll hand back over to Charlie. Thanks very much, Paul and Karen. That's a um, that's really interesting uh, insight into, into the work that's been going on for the last couple of years. And, and since, uh, since we've reached out to NGBs and asked them to, to, um, to, to complete this bit of work, there have been some other sort of comments and questions coming in around the, um, uh, the, the, the level of sort of workload around the assurance framework. So just to echo again, Paul's uh, comment about reaching out and asking for, for, for help and support if you are at, at an NGB that, uh, that where you feel that this, this might put some uh, additional pressures on you. But um, do that sooner rather than later is, is definitely our advice. And um, the, the, the assurance team are a lovely, friendly bunch. So do make sure that you, uh, that, that you get in touch with Paul and he'll be able to uh, offer the support and, and work out uh, how you can you can get through the uh, through, through the assurance framework and make sure you're all nice and compliant, which is what we're after. So um, that's been a been a really interesting sort of nuts and bolts sort of anti-doping session, and we're going to go back to the sharp end again. Return to the sharp end after chatting to a couple of athletes. We're now going to speak to uh, Jim Jones, who is a UCAD uh, DCO or uh, um, uh, testing on. Um, person, <laughs> as we like to, a bit more layman's terms sometimes, but Jim has been um, working as a DCO for UCAD for, for over 30 years and has a, a, a fantastic amount of experience. So we're, uh, we're, we're delighted that he can join us and talk us through his experiences at Tokyo and uh, at games like no other, I understand, Jim. Thank you very much, Charlie. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can hear me loud and clear. Um, yes. A game like no other. My name, as, as Charlie mentioned, is Jim Jones. Uh, he's right. I've been involved in anti-doping for over 32 years. Um, started off, some of you may not be aware, but we used to have a, a Welsh uh, anti-doping agency. Started off with them and then they am amalgamated all the home nations under a UK sport and eventually we came under UCAD. So during those 32 years, um, I've had the opportunity to travel the world and test at uh, world championships. I've worked on behalf of WADA and trained uh, many potential DCOs and also um, attend two Commonwealth Games, uh, both uh, Manchester and Glasgow. And obviously lots of experience on the ground within uh, the UK. But my talk is gonna center around obviously uh, the Olympics because um, I've been fortunate enough to go to um, five Olympics now and um, it is a bug that you get um, I think it's fair to say that um, it started off in London 2012 then on to Sochi, Rio, Pyeongchang in Korea and then finishing a couple of months ago in uh, Tokyo and I think it's also fair to say that they all have had their own challenges those who can remember uh, London, you know, their, their issues with regards to the um, security, pre-Olympic security failings. They had to bring uh, the army in uh, to do all the security checks and so on. In Sochi, you know, we were faced with um, threats towards wetners, Westerners from the Chechnyans. So that was something that, um, you know, we were extremely aware of when we were in uh, Sochi testing. Rio, again, some of you may remember uh, the Zika virus. And, um, you know, that 
uh, had a lot of headline news before you know, Rio started. And Pyeongchang, um, not so much in issues in terms of the organization side and everything else, but from a logistic perspective, so we were probably located 70 kilometers away. And as you'll hear from my presentation, you know, the amount of work that we do and the times we do, it was a long trek, you know, 70 kilometers there and back uh, virtually every day because there was very little hotel space along uh, Pyeongchang. And then finally, we all know um, that we're fortunate that the games did play, place in uh, Tokyo. But Tokyo, I think, was probably one of the ones that I was really looking forward to attending uh, back in uh, 2021, mainly because my day job, I look after uh, tourism and I promote um, North Wales, especially in places um, all over the world, but especially uh, Japan. And we developed a lot of good close work and relationship with the Japanese. And I've had the opportunity to be there probably about a visit there about nine times. So Japan was really the one I was uh, most looking forward to. Sorry, I'm just trying to move my slide forward. Oh, there you go. So how it starts, um, an invite comes out through UCAD um, from the organizing committee and you get an opportunity to apply and you have to apply. It's not a foregone conclusion that you're going to get the opportunity to go. And in this case, there was four groups that you could um, select which one you would like to attend. And there was the Olympics out of competition in competition. Uh, so when the athletes arrive at the village, you start testing them and then you go on to in competition. Or you can just do uh, the Olympics B, which is the Olympics in competition. Paralympics out of competition and in competition the same and also um, Paralympics just in competition. Or you could do both, you could do um, uh, A and B. And from UCAD, we had um, probably about eight altogether attended from UCAD. Some of us done the A and C, some of us done the B, some of us done the C and D and so on. So it was a, quite a mixed bag. But if you are gonna do the Olympics out of competition in competition in Paralympics, you are talking about a commitment of nearly two months because we arrive nearly two and a half weeks before the event starts. So it's a huge, huge commitment. Training was completely different because of COVID. Obviously, um, everything was done digitally. In the past, we have done it um, face to face. But the um, Canadian uh, Centre for Ethics and Sport, they were the ones who initially done all the video training and the exam that we had to pass also. But what's interesting, and I think it's the first time it's ever been done, in the major games like the Olympics was the whole operation was done paperless using a system uh, with PwC uh, called MODOC and that was a huge learning curve because you know for the 32 years that I've been working everything's been done on paper. So MODOC was a, a big learning experience for us. We, used, we received a huge supply of emails and you can imagine with so much information and they had a playbook that was available to everyone who was going to Togo that told us all about the country and um, what needs to be done when you arrive and so on. And for information on the events themselves, there's another piece of uh, digital software called MyInfo. And we use that quite um, heavily and I'll talk about that very, very shortly. Now, as I would, I chose to go to um, the Olympics and the Paralympics. Um, unfortunately for me, probably about three weeks out, I ended up somehow or other detaching my retina, which kind of put an end to me thinking about flying out um, early July to attend the outer competition testing before the Olympics. And you, as you can imagine, you know, like you athletes, you train and prepare and look forward to, I'm absolutely gutted because it looks like, you know, um, the, the Olympic games that I really wanted to go to, I wasn't going to uh, be able to because of um, sickness. Um, informing the organizing committee, Unfortunately, their response was, well, you know, we've had to cancel the fly flight and there you go, you're going to have to pay for the cancellation charge, which is a little bit upsetting and disappointing. Um, and if you do want to come at a later date, whether it's to the Olympics or the Paralympics, then you need to sort out your own logistics in terms of airfare. So I, I think for me that was quite uh, disappointing on top of, you know, what you read in the press and you were aware and from people that I know in Japan, how much there was in terms of the anti-sentiment towards the, the games taking place. We were also aware that there was a, 
quite a big dropout from UCAD in the numbers of um, open control officers who had meant to go. I think it was over 50% had dropped out, mainly because of the issues associated with the social distancing, the worry about COVID, and obviously headlines like this as well. So why on earth would I want to go to um, a place that really didn't want um, the Olympics to take place? Well, that's how it's been reported in the media. You know, and um, already been told if you want to go, you're going to have to find your own money to find your own flight. And um, knowing how hot it is in Tokyo and how humid it is that time of year, because I, I think I mentioned I've been there probably about eight times. So I do know the country quite well and um, how hot it does get and how humid it gets. Um, so why on earth would I want to um, go? And I think it's fair to say it's, it's first of all, it's, it's obviously to represent the UCAT. Um, because you know, that's something I've been doing for a long, long time and quite proud of the fact, you know, going overseas or going anywhere, you know, that we are representing a, a very, very professional organisation. But also it's the memories that you make and the friends that you make. And you're working with some of the best and most experienced doping control officers um, in the world. Uh, some of you and some of you athletes and governing bodies, you know, may have come across us and it all seemed extremely serious, uh, especially when you're notified and you come into doping control. But we are human. And as you can see, especially in the top right picture, you know, we're as chuffed as anybody else when, you know, our teams are doing extremely well. And you can see, you know, when we've got some downtime, we are watching the games to keep up with, you know, how many medals have been won. Now, these people, um, you know, come from all over the world. And as I said, they are some of the most experienced open control officers um, in the world. Otherwise, they wouldn't be attending one of the biggest games in the world. And I think that's what spurred me on to want to get better as quickly as I possibly, as I possibly could with my, obviously with my eye. Um, the repair was going well, and my consultant um, kind of gave me the green light to say, if you want to go, you can go. Um, so I opted to go, and I went just for the Olympics because they had to have further treatment when I came back. Um, this time, normally when you arrive, again, probably with athletes, you turn up at a huge centre and you get kitted out and measured out for, for your clothing. In this particular case, when you arrive, your clothing arrives as well. And what's interesting is, you know, sizes, especially from the Western side, you know, our sizes, when we say we're large XL, it's a little bit different. So there was quite a lot of fun to be had because people were getting completely different sizes or they asked for a large and actually it was probably a small and so on. So, but you can see the type of um, clothing that we were equipped with and that was our uniform and it, you know, extremely generous. Uh, the pass in the middle um, was again, another privilege for um, doping control personnel because it is access all areas. And we do go to the places and we're extremely privileged to go to those places as well, where not many other people apart from obviously the athletes uh, go to. I mentioned about all the uh, digital software that we had to learn. Uh, one of the um, obviously big issues was COVID. It was on the rise in Tokyo and they were in a state of emergency. So we had to quickly understand how to use this Ocha app. And as you can see, the first thing we needed to do is to download it and um, obviously do all the testing before we traveled. So we had to do two tests uh, before we actually left within the 72 hours. On entering in Japan, again, those who were there knew you had to do a COVID test at the airport. It probably took us from landing around about four and a half, five hours before we actually got out of the airport. And when we did get out of the airport, we could only go in designated transport, direct to the hotel. At the games, you know, we were tested, um, eventually we were tested every single day. So every day we had to bring our sample and put it in a, a box just outside the entrance for it to be tested. And then on leaving, obviously, we had to upload all our paperwork and do a test after we arrived. You see in the bottom left, that was the, um, the sample kit that we were given, and it was for the spit test. And each day we had to register our temperature and check, you know, how things were going. And you can see day 12, I was still not cleared. So the only thing I could do was to um, go to my venue. The first four days, uh, this is how we received our food. The picture you'll see a little bag was left on the door at eight o'clock in the morning and inside 
you see here we have our pastries and that was a breakfast and that was provided for us. And if we wanted evening meal, then we'd obviously go for a takeaway. So for the first three or four days, we stayed in our hotel room, we weren't allowed out. But after those four days, we were then allowed to go direct to the area that we were working or the stadium uh, that we were working. Up until then, uh, bear in mind, I'd come, I hadn't come pre-games for the out-competition testing. I'd come three days, more or less, no, about four days, more or less, before the Olympic Games actually started. And up until then, I still wasn't sure what um, my role was. And um, sorry, I'll just put this picture in because, you know, one of the benefits of being in COVID is you could only travel in twos. And bear in mind, we'd all been tested on a regular basis. Going back to Pyeongchang, because obviously there was no COVID, we had to travel 70 kilometers and it was a case of squashing everybody into a, a vehicle. So it was about five or six traveling 70 kilometers. So there was some perks to uh, traveling uh, with, the, um, with the COVID pandemic. Some of the jobs um, I was just gonna mention, doping control station manager, doping control officers, chaperone coordinator. Now, most of us, especially the international DCOs had roles of station manager. And I was gonna mention just before I um, was through those three days, I found out what job I was doing. It didn't really come as a surprise, but what surprised me was how you know, quick I had to prepare because the, from London to Rio and then into Tokyo, I was the doping control station manager responsible for the aquatics, so all the swimming, which is one of those big blue ribbon events where you predominantly do the most tests. And it's an extremely pressurized um, piece of work. And to be told probably two days before, obviously panic set in because hadn't been to the aquatic center uh, because I was still stuck in my room. Didn't know who the staff was, didn't know how well trained they were. So there's all sorts of uh, questions that needed to be answered. But as I mentioned, most of our UCAD um, colleagues had these type of roles. Also we undertook roles, token control officers and chaperone coordinators, which is where you coordinate a huge group of chaperones. And in some cases like the athletics and like the uh, swimming, you're talking about you know, between 40 and 50 chaperones per shift. Our shifts were long, as you can see, if you had to be at the aquatic center at five o'clock, you were up at 3.30, you've obviously there was no breakfast there for you, um, but you had to get in the a taxi that was arranged direct to the venue and you'd finish around about 6 p.m. If you were on the evening shift, then you would get um, up into the taxi at 3.30 and then you'd finish on average around about 1.30. I remember the first night of testing in the aquatic center, we'd actually finished at 10.30, all our tests had been done and the logistics had arranged for the truck to pick, it, pick up the samples at 3.30 in the morning. So we, you know, we had nearly five hours where we had to sit there in an empty aquatic center waiting for the transport and you can imagine uh, didn't go down too well um, we obviously constantly on the phone on the emails uh, trying to communicate you know this isn't acceptable and it seemed like you know as we went forward 10 30 was probably the cutoff that we were going to finish the testing and the swimmers had all been tested in those um, those days i mentioned i was the station manager responsible for the testing at the um, the swimming aquatics absolutely phenomenal stadium, um, like they all have been. Um, I think that's one thing that I bring home with me all the time is the quality from London right the way through to Sochi, uh, to Rio and to Pyeongchang. The stadiums are just absolutely phenomenal. I think the crying and shame specifically about this one is obviously no spectators. And that was the real, um, and, and I felt that because, you know, being used to being in full stadiums, especially at aquatics um, and in the Paralympics as well. The noise just puts the hairs on the back of your head on end. So it was a real, um, real, real shame. Um, for those of you who don't know um, swimming, I think um, it's fair to say we have the best seat in the house because that's our table there just in front of you. And the way it works in swimming, which is quite unique to the other sports, is that all the accreditation from the swimmers are brought to the table. So there's eight swimmers, we have eight accreditations. Our chaperones stand just behind us. And when the swimmers get out of the pool, they come directly to the table. And lo and behold, they see that their accreditation isn't there. So um, they know they've been selected. 
again, like all the um, games, all the medalists are tested um, for fifth and sixth. So with swimming, especially the finals, it is full on because you've got one final after another. And, you know, you're notifying, you know, six swimmers and then the next race starts and then you're notifying the next six swimmers. So the chaperones and DCO, DCO really need to be um, on their mark in order to be able to deal with that. And a typical schedule uh, for swimming, as you can see there is on the left, this is the system I mentioned to you where you find out all that information uh, called my info. So we would, um, if it's an evening session as this, it wasn't the finals, you'd have a random selection from that lot from about, I would say about 20, 26 to 30. Um, but then the finals in this case, which was again unique, were held in the morning and you would do all the finalists and all the finals and obviously the relays as well. Um, just going back, but the, I must say, as it has been with nearly all the games, you know, the facilities are the best of the best. And you can imagine, especially with the, the Japanese as well, the facilities that we had within the swimming centre were the best of the best. And um, that goes without saying. And ample and very, very spacious and not too far away from the pool. Some of you who went to Tokyo, um, you know, you were all tucked up in bed because the photo on the left, which is the main plaza, which is a very, very busy place in the day. I think this is about um, 2.30 2 in the morning. And uh, when we were leaving, leaving work, because we're normally always the last, apart from security, to be leaving uh, the venues. And the one on the right, this was around about 4, it must be about 4.45, getting into work for 5 o'clock. And again, you can see there's no one around, and the only ones around are security. So we do work extremely long hours um, in intense pressure uh, constantly once we start. Uh, the, the, um, these are both taken from the village. And um, from the village, as you know, you know we start at five o'clock and we start knocking on the doors just shortly after in order to try and access the athletes to come to uh, doping control. The kit, again, some of you will be familiar with this. Uh, we use and the DCOs from across the world are all are very, very fam uh, familiar, is the Berlinger kit. Uh, we use this obviously in UCAD. And um, so when you think you bring in hundreds of IDC, international DCOs from all over the world, mixing with the Japanese DCOs as well, you know, we, it, everything is familiar, you know, because you know, they're the procedures that we all kind of work to. Um, I know we do in um, UCAD to the, to the word of the book. And I think that everybody else, and those, those DCOs that I mentioned before, are probably the um, most experienced that you will come across um, in the world. Security, extremely tight. Um, so anything we've done with the samples, as well as going through our own chain of custody within the doping control, when um, they were about to be delivered, this little van, uh, quite a cute little van as well, uh, turned up. And we would um, go out to meet it. And then you can see every little doorway was taped up with the code. These had to be checked. And um, you can see the paperwork in the middle, uh, right? You know, all the numbers had to be cross-checked. All the samples that we had were all boxed and secured in a seal. And then they were handed over. And once that was handed over, you'd go back to doping control. Because we were using a digital electronic system, all the reports were done digitally, which also was great because you didn't have to you know, go home and finish off the report. So once you'd finished, you more or less uh, finished. But I must say, you know, the facilities, the logistics and everything else were absolutely spot on. And there were very, very um, few complaints as far as I'm aware from athletes or government bodies. And it's also worthwhile saying as well, it's the first time that the ITA have taken over responsibility for the testing of the, um, of the major event like the Olympics. From the ITA, um, just to give you a snapshot of the work that we all contributed for, uh, towards uh, for the Olympics itself. And you can see there's you know, huge numbers are there. And um, bear in mind, I mentioned 50% dropout rate from UCAD. This was replicated right across the world. So the number of DCOs that we probably would have had originally you know, went there. So we, we had to work extremely hard um, in order to achieve these results. And eventually, um, and fair to say, the day we all look forward to um, was um, day 14, 
which give you the clearance, um, which allowed you then to, we have still be, bear in mind, we're still being PCR tested every day, but allowed us then to be able to go out and enjoy um, the sights and the sounds and what I know best about Tokyo. And one of the reasons a lot of people put themselves out to go to these big events is to immerse themselves within the culture. And, you know, Tokyo is one of those countries uh, from across the world that I've been to that is a place that you can definitely immerse yourself in the culture. Unfortunately for me, I only had um, a one day in order to do this because the rest of the time was working. And then I was due back to do some further work on, on my eye from a medical perspective. But I was obviously so pleased that I had the opportunity to go to the Olympics. Um, as I said, you know, this is one of the real pulls. And you know, it's the same with yourselves. If you work in government bodies, you have a real team spirit. You know, these do come from all over the world. You make some great friendships that last for a long, long time. And then when you go, you meet up, you try to have as much fun as you possibly can within the circumstances. And, um, you know, and you, you've created you know, great memories. And you've also hopefully done a great job by protecting and keeping sport clean. Just some random photos. I still say from all the events that I've been to, the Italians are probably the most suavest, you know, from their, their kit, their tracksuits. But, you know, it's staggered to see, you know, that they had their own car here in Italy, which again is smart. And I think it's also fair to say that there was definitely more press, as you would imagine, when there's a, a crisis like the pandemic in, in Tokyo. Um, there was more, more press than spectators. And I think um, looking back, you know, that was probably the biggest disappointment is the athletes not having that opportunity to perform in front of their friends, their family, and a huge audience. But, um, you know, hopefully, you know, the, the, the media back home done a great job. Anyway, just some takeaways from my perspective. I think as I give you an example, I didn't know what role I was going to have until, you know, two days before. And, you know, it's really important that people who are going to these major events are experienced. Um, not just for the organizer side, but also for the athletes, because the procedures have got to be spot on, um, which they are, and everything that we do is all built towards that. I don't think there's definitely no going back now for uh, major games like the Olympics. I think paperless is definitely the way forward. The MODOC system, and I know there's others out there, is really easy once you've mastered it to work. And um, yeah, and for, for us, I, I think it's definitely the way to go. And, uh, we'll watch this space because I just can't see uh, us going back to paper. Um, one thing, and I think for the ITA, you know, we've just in our WhatsApp group of testers from all over the world, you know, we've got a lot of knowledge there, but it's interesting that there's been no evaluation undertaken on, you know, what our experiences were and what we can offer in terms of, you know, advice going forward, and especially, you know, working with such a, a diverse group of international people coming to a foreign country then, you know, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of needs that need to be met. Um, and we are professional people. And, um, you know, and we, we, I, I think we do get treated as we are, you know, professional people. But I think there's a huge opportunity there to evaluate what we did. There's no getting away from every games that I've done, you know, whether it's Commonwealth Games, World Championship, you know, we work hard and long hours. Uh, we work extremely hard. Um, in games like the Olympics, it's not a holiday. You don't get uh, many days off. You're lucky to get one or two days in the whole period. And in this particular case, the days you had off, you had to stay in your hotel until you uh, cleared the quarantine. And finally, uh, for me, as always, it's um, a huge sense of achievement and knowing that you know we've played a huge part in trying to keep sport as clean as possible for um, you, uh, the athletes. So I'll finish there, if that's okay. And I don't know if I've, got, if I've run over, I've got time for questions, but happy to take any of the others. Yeah, that was fascinating. Thank you very much indeed for, for sharing your experiences. And um, uh, it certainly highlights to me how, how fortunate we are to have uh, you as a UCAD DCO given, given that level of experience. So that's, that's really interesting. We have had a couple of questions that have come through. Um, a couple of longer ones and a couple of shorter ones. So I might go for a long one first, Jim, but you're right, we have overrun slightly. Uh, but there's a bit of question that's come through about languages and interpreters. And given that this is the world's games and all these athletes are coming together, how, how did you manage dealing with athletes who, um, who, who, whose language needs weren't met by your team? 
Yeah, although that's a really good question because the, the fortunate position for me is I'm, you know, I was doing these swimming. So most of the people that came into um, the anti-doping room have all been tested before. There was very, very few swimmers that I've come across that hadn't been tested. So they understood uh, the procedure. They, so I didn't really come across that. The problem I had, the biggest communication I had is because we didn't have international chaperones. So we relied on local chaperones and the English was not um, very good at all. So that did cause quite a few communication problems. And I would imagine because they were front of house, they were the first ones to meet the athlete that potentially, you know, that could have been a little bit of a conflict. But I know through the procedures, all the DCO spoke good English. It's one of the prerequisites. Most people um, that came in, most athletes that came in, brought somebody with them who spoke English. And, and again, as I said, they were all tended to be familiar with the procedure. But also, if we needed some, there was a translation line that we could phone and an interpreter could come. So that logistically, that was all provided. And just another level of complexity onto, onto to working at a big, at a big multi, multinational games. Um, so two very quick questions. These are slightly more frivolous, Jim. So um, do forgive us for those. But it's your favorite games and the most famous athlete you met in Tokyo, please. No, I, um, do you know what? It's interesting because I've been around such a long time. Um, <laughs> All, all, all the athletes are, are famous, to be fair. And I think, um, especially in the swimming world, you know, from the Rio days, you know, we were testing uh, Michael Phelps. You know, he used to come to doping control nearly six times every night he came to doping control. Um, so you see, I think in the early in the early visuals I put, uh, you know, Claire Bolin and Helen Skelton, you know, out there reporting, you know, they were, they were nice to see. But I think for us, you know, we treat every athlete with respect uh, that they deserve. Uh, we, you know, treat them all exactly the same. But, you know, you can imagine, you know, through 32 years, we've come across a lot of characters and a lot of, you know, very, very uh, famous people. But uh, it doesn't matter, you know, if they come last, they're treated exactly the same within the doping control. And, um, yeah, we, and as I said, it does, what I feel is it does come across that we're, you know, the doping control process is really serious and, and it is from that side of things, but we, you know, we, we try to make people feel as comfortable as possible. Because we're like, we're only human. That's the, the, that is the professional answer that we, we, we expected, Jim. But, um, uh, once again, thank you very much indeed, um, for, for joining us today. Really appreciate the time uh, that you put into to the presentation and sharing your experiences with us. It's, um, yeah, like you said, it's a shame that more sports fans couldn't be out there, but um, insights like yours and from the athletes today have really sort of helped us um, uh, feel as though we, we, we've got some takeaways from, from, from people who are there in Tokyo. So thanks again for your time, Jim. Thank you. Okay, excellent. We're going to move on to our next session now. And uh, this one um, uh, sticks with me. Um, and we are joined by Emma Price. Uh, UCAD's head of testing, and we are uh, going to be talking about the challenges that we've um, faced uh, during COVID and how we've been able to uh, run, a, run a testing program uh, from, yes, uh, from, from, from March 2020 until um, up until now and how that's changed. So, Emma, first of all, um, I'm sure you'll be known to many of our audience today, but perhaps if you just give us a, a quick introduction um, to you, your role, and um, your role in anti-token. Sure. Um, afternoon, everyone. I'm hoping you're enjoying this afternoon's session. Uh, so yes, I'm Emma Price, Head of Testing at UK Anti-Doping. Um, ultimately, I am responsible for everything from the planning to the imp implementation of the testing programme. So who, when, what, how to test, um, through to looking after our, our doping control personnel. So, so Jim himself and, and others um, out there in the UK setting procedures, as well as looking after the uh, whereabouts program that we operate. Excellent, and uh, I'm sure you can give us some gossip about Jim um, if we if we needed it as well. But he's got time uh, at the end. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant. Um, okay, so I don't need to tell you or the audience that we were all sent into a complete tailspin in March 2020 um, and I don't know about you but looking back on it in, in my head it's sort of compartmentalized into a 
a, a completely bizarre time for everybody. You know, we're all trying to work out our own personal situations, let alone our responsibilities to to to, to our jobs and and clean sport. But I would be very interested to hear, and as our audience would as well, is, is what your initial reaction and response was to 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 the UK government's lockdown um, in, in the middle of March. Yeah, certainly. I mean, yeah, looking back to February, March 2020 certainly feels like a, a long time ago, but it's still fresh in the memory at the same time. So it was obviously a very uncertain period of time, probably more questions than answers at, at that particular time as well. Um, so it was hugely concerning for us and particularly with, with the testing process itself, as, as we all know, it's in person continuous observation so there's there's close interaction between our doping control personnel and the athletes um, and the very nature of our testing program means our doping control personnel are going from venue to venue whether it's competitions training grounds home addresses hotels all over the country so the risk was clear you know there was a very clear health and safety risk so first and foremost for us it was how on earth are we going to protect the welfare and the well-being of everyone involved in that testing process? So obviously, primarily our, our doping control personnel and the athletes. Um, but at the same time, we've still got responsibility. The testing programme is there to uphold the integrity of anti-doping and to protect sports and protect clean athletes. So we still need to address and deliver on our responsibility there. Um, but obviously, as we saw, the situation worsened within the UK. Sport was getting cancelled initially internationally and then domestically. Um, venues were getting shut down. And then obviously the lockdown happened and ultimately led to the probably one of the hardest decisions we've ever had to make, which was significantly reducing our testing programme. So, yeah, that was a very, very tough time. Okay, not, not one that you'd, uh, you'd have expected to have to take when you when you when you joined UK Antidoping and you know committed your professional life to, to protecting sports I'm sure that was quite a complicated one to get your head around but what what would be really interesting is just to go through the steps that you had and you and the rest of the team took to ensure that testing could be conducted safely because I'm sure that you know that's one of the key considerations from my role from the communication side was ensuring that People were aware that we weren't endangering, um, you know, athlete welfare and our DCL welfare in terms of you know, spreading the virus. But also, we, we still wanted people to have confidence in in clean sport. Yeah, I mean, I mean it certainly wasn't in the job description at the time, but um, I don't think it was in anyone's. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, I think it's it's probably stating the obvious for for a lot of people on on this today but a risk assessment that is that is pivotal to everything um so you know identifying exactly where the risks were within the process and, and how we were going to mitigate those risks to to lower it um and part of that process was engaging with the the core groups who are impacted and involved in the process so our, our athletes and we engage with the athlete commission as well um, the NGBs, the sports, obviously, are, are trying to protect their sports and protect their athletes. And, of course, our, our doping control personnel who are, are conducting that process. So that was, you know, the foundation um, of the work that we did. Um, you know, I'm not a medical expert in, in terms of disease control and prevention. And so seeking expertise to help advise us, guide us. Um, so we engaged with two members who were part of the Return to Sport group. Um, that group was set up to implement and, and provide protocols for sports to return to sport, to return to training and competition safely. So two of those uh, group members uh, helped us and provided us with considerations and, and guidance um, to plug, I suppose, that knowledge gap. Um, we also worked with the, the, the wider anti-doping community, so particularly our, our colleagues in other national anti-doping organisations, um, as well as WADA. Um, you know, this was not just a, a UK specific issue, this was a global issue. And we're all here to deliver the same objectives, the same goals. So it was important for us to learn from each other um, and try and find a standard. And certainly that was something we were proud to be involved with um, in terms of being one of those 
organizations that helped kind of contribute to to what the uh, anti-doping organization guidelines were um, that were published by WADA uh, last year to try and I suppose, introduce some sort of standardized approach to, to protect everyone globally. Um, there were obvious procedural changes, so I won't bore everyone with things around PPE and social distancing, hand hygiene and cleaning. I think we've all had to learn, learn those as we've gone along, but obviously trying to integrate that into the documentary process itself. So you know, the, the, the steps required to collect a sample, they've, they've not changed, but you know, you've, you've got to introduce these additional measures and there's additional considerations about how you go about that. Um, and then make sure we've got the resources available to inform and provide the, the information that sports athletes, our doping control personnel need to understand what's, what's changing and what their role is in terms of protecting each other. Um, and then working with the sports, again, everyone takes a different approach and understanding what each individual sport was doing at their venues, at their competitions to make sure we could meet those requirements, as well as protect the integrity of the process. Um, so working very closely with them and then doing the training with all of our doping control personnel, making sure they were comfortable with, with their responsibilities. Because again, they were, they're the, they're the front, front of the house, you know, they, they go out there, they, they were leaving their homes and having to actually implement the changes to the process. So there was a lot of work to, to make sure that, you know, testing could continue to happen and, to continue happening safely. Yeah, that's fascinating. And, and your, your point there around trying to um, get to grip with the, the with with ever changing processes and regulations, you know, on a on an international front. But I do remember having conversations with you about how to coordinate within the UK alone, given the diff the devolved governments and their different um, different. Um, legislation that was coming in as well so you know trying to clutch trying to clutch sand going through your hands at times I, I imagine that um so this this is our last session of the day um but do keep your questions coming in so we, we have got a couple that we're going to going to pop to emma uh, from the audience but um given all of those different um parameters that you were trying to work in how did you react to the to the changes that were that were laid at your doorstep yeah, I mean, I think a lot of, of what I've, I've mentioned in terms of we continue to, to engage with the two, two experts from the return to sport group to constantly seek advice and reverting back to that risk assessment to make sure our, our measures in place were still sufficient and suitable. But, you know, learning and adapting, trying to understand what the, the nuances were between the different um, home nations. And, you know, at one point it was dealing with, you know, schoolwork, you know regional restrictions. So we had had you know we were having daily meetings we had kind of like a whatsapp group between um some of us that it was like oh hang on Lester's going into lockdown at midnight what are we going to do what does this mean for for us so there was a lot of reactivity because obviously things were just changing constantly um but you know the fundamental principles remained the mm -hmm. same throughout but making sure that we continued that engagement and any changes obviously, you know continuing to inform um RNGBs, the athletes and, and our doping control personnel and there was a bit of you know again trying to prepare at the same time for a, a worst case scenario well what ifs and and those sorts of things which um, you know it's hard to predict and certainly you know not all of our predictions came true I don't think anyone's we really did um, certainly I was looking forward to Christmas last year thinking it'd be the end but um, yeah so it was Trying to prepare, learn from again, learning from the other national anti-doping organisations. We saw a couple implement alternative ways of testing using a motor home and doing it virtually. Um, and actually, we we were put in put into that position where we had to make that decision. You know, we did a short period of time where some of our testing was conducted within a, a motor home, and then we had a couple of months at the beginning of this year when when it was pretty dire in the UK, where we. Uh, implemented a, a remote sample collection where the doping control officer basically conducted the test for the, the athlete just like this over a, a virtual virtual call so um you know we're back to standard ways of testing now where it's back to in person and but ultimately actually the the measures we've applied from the very beginning are still in place in, in relation to ppe and social distancing so you know we, we've still got a responsibility to protect sport during covid as much as we can so yeah, it's uh, 
changed a lot and yeah as we all have had to adapt and try and learn and, and move on from it indeed so we've yeah we've had we have had a couple of questions here i'm going to sort of merge them together just because i'm keeping an eye on the time but very quickly what are the, what are the top things you've learned or as an organization and are we better equipped to deal with something like this again so i mean not wanting to get too apocalyptic about about what the next year might hold for us but um yeah is, is, is there a way you could quickly sum up um new learnings and our preparedness yeah i mean it, again it might sound obvious but risk assessment is absolutely key knowing where your risks are and knowing what measures you're going to put in place and the rationale behind it because then that forms your basis for the procedures and protocols you put in place and then any decisions you face, even when you're facing COVID fatigue of having this going on for, for 18 months or so, you can constantly revert back to that and you can look back at your justification and why are these measures in place to make those decisions because we've all got our own opinions on this. You know, we're, we're dealing with trying to manage a workforce of 200 dope control personnel working with over 40 sports and, and then thousands of athletes. You know, not everyone is going to agree with decisions that we make but that risk assessment is fundamental to, to all of it so certainly that um and you know we've all got a role to play in this it wasn't just about us setting out what changes we're going to make it's making sure that those involved knew their responsibilities and what their role was in protecting each other um and you know that continues on everyone's still got to play their part to protect one another um and yeah, alternative testing, if, if the needs arise, it's there, we know it can work. It's not the gold standard, but certainly it's possible. It's probably something I wouldn't have thought we would have done ever before. Um, and yeah, fingers crossed we don't have to, but at least we've got a blueprint, we've got a risk assessment and we're better informed. So I do think we are in a much better position to, to manage it should, hopefully not, um, it ever come up again. Excellent. That's really interesting. You know, the phrase "innovation loves a crisis," so we've, um, yeah, we've, we've definitely had to um, see, see you guys you know, reacting to that and, and working out ways to continue the testing. And that's one of the questions that has come through. You just answered it, and uh, that's that's great. Is, is you know, do we see a place for that in the future? And I think that's I think that's been very clear that you know, these these lessons aren't just going to be forgotten, but they they'll be plugged in going forward so that's that's fascinating well that does bring us to the end of of, of our chat emma thank you very much indeed for your time uh, but also to the end of uh, day one the lights have just gone out in the room i'm in so i think uh our guys here are very uh, are very very on it with the timetable as well so we have just overrun so apologies for that but my uh, sincere thanks to all of the uh, presenters and uh, and contributors for today uh, and all of you as well here for, for joining us there's been some really good numbers uh, some excellent interaction uh, for, from you all and some really good questions so um, we look forward to uh, you joining us tomorrow when we're going to be having a bit more of a look ahead rather than a look back so uh, we've got sessions around Birmingham and the Commonwealth Games and uh, and also on international cooperation which is uh, a nice touch on um, uh, following up on Emma's point there so we, um, yeah, oh, I've just had a uh, quick note from Emma actually, just to say that the, she wants to acknowledge and a big thank you to all of the, all of the UCAD team and the, and the DCB and GBs, everybody in supporting uh, UCAD and, and her for, for, for managing the testing during, uh, during the lockdown. So um, just want to make sure that Emma's point is made there as well. Uh, also tomorrow, looking uh, at the mental health challenges around anti-doping, and also uh, looking ahead to the 2022 prohibited list and some changes that could be coming everybody's way on that. So thank you again to everybody for joining us and we look forward to seeing you at one o'clock uh, British summertime uh, tomorrow. Thank you. Bye-bye.